Hello, friends. Welcome to ABN's Trinity Channel for another episode of Colliding Worldviews. Today is Monday, September 25th in the year of our Lord, 2017. And it's a blessing to have you back here once again for another show that we uh, happens every single Monday. So please, if you have friends, family members, neighbors, coworkers, etc., who don't know about Colliding Worldviews, let them know it's a show that we do every single Monday. And about 60% of the time, the topic is Islam, but we do many other topics as well. We always have one guest here for the entire hour, a little bit different than the marathon shows where we usually have three to four people on a show for an hour or an hour and a half or even two hours which is going to be happening in the upcoming International Apologetics Marathon, October 2nd through 6th. Yes, we're going to have 14 shows that are happening Monday through Friday, and that's just in English. If you watch the Arabic channel, you're going to get more stuff there as well. But please let everyone know the 2nd International Apologetics Marathon of 2017 is happening October 2nd through 6th. And they can watch it for free, not only at trinitychannel.com, but also on many internet-based devices like Apple TV, Amazon Fire Stick TV, Roku, Chromecastic, IPTVs, any Apple or Android devices. You just download the ABN Sat app. You can watch the entire ABN digital tree, which is about 50 different channels. If you want to watch debates, you can watch debates 24-7. If you want politics, you can watch that. If you want to watch apologetics, you can watch that as well. And again, everything that happens live on the Trinity channel, you can watch on those devices as well. I just talked to someone the other day. They had, they had Roku, and they didn't know that this, this was viewable on there. So I said, hey, just go get the ABN Sat app. You can download it for free, and then you can, there on Roku, watch the Trinity channel anytime you want. So we thank you for your prayers and your continued uh, support of ABN The Training Channel, which allow all of these shows to flow through satellite to four different continents and also, of course, throughout the whole world through high-speed Internet. Now, today on Colliding Worldviews, our topic is Islam and women, fear or freedom. And my guest is Fouad Masri. Fouad was born and raised in the war zone of Beirut, Lebanon. As a third generation ordained pastor, he has a passion for sharing the love of Christ with Muslims and has been reaching out to Muslims and inspiring others to follow his example since 1979. In 1993, he founded Crescent Project to nurture transformational relationships between Christians and Muslims and to rally the church to reach out to Muslims to share the good news of Christ. He has trained more than 30,000 Christians to share their faith with Muslims through both the Bridges One Day and Sahara Challenge training experiences. He has served as a guest instructor at several in universities and Christian ministries and has been featured in several media publications, including Christianity Today, Newsweek, and Mission Network News. He has appeared on CBN, TBN, The Janet Parshall Show, and Primetime America, and also ABN and the Trinity Channel. He's back here once again. So, Fouad, thank you so much for coming back to ABN's Trinity Channel. Thanks, Tony. Great to be with you today. It's great to have you here. I also want to let our viewers know, too, that you hold a bachelor degree in mass communication and a master's degree from Fuller Theological Seminary in Islamic Studies. Friends, his websites are crescentproject.org and also unlockthetruth.net. Also, I want to encourage you to get his book. I have it right, or one of his books. I have it right here, Connecting with Muslims, A Guide to Communicating Effectively uh, by Fouad Masri, forward by Josh McDowell. And as you can see there, the book is on your screen. Go to Amazon or anywhere else where you buy books. You can also buy this book at crescentproject.org as well. But this is a great resource to use in a Sunday school class or just to read on your own if you want to reach out to Muslims or if you have a friend who wants to reach out to Muslims. And they're like, hey, what do I say to my Muslim neighbor, my, my Muslim coworker who I see all the time? Uh, you know, what should I say to them? Get Fouad's resources, because they are great resources to use. But Fouad, it's a blessing to have you back here on ABN's Trinity Channel for Colliding Worldviews. So we're going to have you here for the whole hour talking about uh, Islam and women, which, of course, uh, you and I are, are not women, but that's a very important topic for people to, to know about. So 
it, it's great to have you here. And and why uh, do you think in general this is an important topic for people to, to know about, especially the non-Muslims out there? Yes, thank you, Tony. This is an issue that has been under the rug for many years. It is said that today, uh, Islamic countries do not address these issues, and Western countries, which are supposed to be about equality, about f religion, about freedom of women, never address these issues uh, under the guise of maybe uh, the idea that we need to respect other cultures. Uh, sadly, m Muslim women are suffering. Uh, growing up in the Middle East, you see those issues over and over, and you are correct. We should not be talking about it. Where are the women who should be talking about it? The reason you and I are having this program, because it's time that we address this issue and we're praying for God to raise up more women. As a ministry, Crescent Project has a conference called Without Borders, just on sharing the gospel with Muslim women. We've started this conference about four years ago. The next one is happening this weekend in Columbus, Ohio, without borders in Ohio, just focusing on women issues and what should Christian women do in sharing the good news with Muslim women. Because there are a lot of issues, religious, social, political, that no one is addressing. And we are busy with Twitter accounts. We're busy with some statements and nobody is talking about uh, issues of the heart, issues of life, issues of uh, uh, oppression. M Muslim women today, some are beheaded, some are stoned. Some are uh, forced into marriages. Some are raped. And how can we say it's the 21st century? How can we say that we've reached, you know, a, an epitome of knowledge? It's the age of technology, the age of information. Yet still there are women ages 8, 9, 10, 12, 15, 20 being stoned or beheaded or raped uh, in, in Muslim countries. And that's not acceptable. We need to speak up about these issues. Definitely. And here in the West, as you know, Fouad, uh, Americans get a different view uh, when we see the news, when we see different uh, things that happen uh, throughout the United States, when we see women, Muslim women, wearing this, this uh, head covering or uh, uh, hijab. And of course, there are burqas where like, their entire body is, is covered, their face is covered and all of that. But uh, today, the media portrays Muslim women with hijab, especially here in the West. So can you please explain to our audience, because we do have viewers out there who just don't know anything about Islam, and especially don't know anything about how women are treated or what the primary sources say about women or anything like that. So just as a base, can you please explain to our audience, what is a hijab? Thank you. Hijab is an Arabic word, which means a veil or a separation. The issue with hijab is the Quran does not describe hijab. The Quran, supposed to be the holy book of Islam, is, it says only one statement, that good women who love God must dress modest. It does not say what does that mean. However, hijab was introduced by Muhammad because from the traditions of Muhammad, we know he had 12 wives. Um, well, there's 13, but the 13th one, we're not sure if it was pleasure marriage, temporary marriage, or a full marriage. But uh, the 12 wives of Muhammad, uh, he was afraid that men in his army would look at them. So he created the hijab. Now, each culture designs more. So, for example, in Iran, we call it shador. In Afghanistan, we use the word bur uh, burqa, which means a, a covering. Um, so uh, each culture adds more to it. And that's where the hijab comes from. Um, according to uh, Islamic speakers and leaders, they say to be a good Muslim woman, you have to wear the hijab and your hair must not show and your, the, the clothes should be up to your uh, wrists. So there's all these rules uh, on how a woman should dress. Uh, however, as modernity came to these countries and education, education came to these countries, you find that some Muslims would dress the hijab, some might not. Now in America, we see a lot of people wear tight jeans, a tight shirt, and then they put a scarf and they call themselves hijabi. So it, it makes me smile because... Uh, 
it's just the way it's a political statement that I am Muslim. Uh, it was said, though, after September 11, after the attacks of September 11, a couple of universities said that in solidarity with Islam, we should wear the hijab, which was a disgrace because here's the worst attack on American soil. Some people were saying, oh, we should wear the hijab. Isn't that embarrassing? Instead of saying, let's put something about the American flag or maybe talk about those who died responding. But as usual, there is a political agenda, there's Islamic propaganda, where somehow we want to distance ourselves from terrorism as Muslims. And the hijab becomes a symbol. Uh, people argued, well, it's a symbol of freedom. It's her choice. Uh, but in reality, it's saying that she is a woman and she has to be somehow protected from men's eyes and men's um, uh, approaching them. Now, Fouad, what's very interesting is uh, we get this Western education from the mainstream media, and there's actually been a, a number of news stories on this. I'm not sure if, you, if you've seen them, and if our viewers haven't heard of it, there's actually been a number of college, university campuses throughout the United States where I've actually seen pictures of Muslims going and setting up like a dawah table, basically, but it's like a, a wear a hijab for a day uh, uh, challenge or, or, you know, see what it's like to wear a hijab. And actually they, they go, they go to that table, they put on a hijab, they walk around campus all day, uh, to again, have solidarity or just to experience what it's like to wear one or to, or for whatever reason. Now it's interesting that we don't have any tables set up on university campuses where we are, we have a bunch of crucifixes and we say, hey, if you want to wear a crucifix for a day to, to have solidarity with Christians and, and see what it's like to, to be a Christian, you know, here's a, a, a crucifix necklace or a crucifix pendant you can wear around the campus for the day. At the end of the day, come and bring it back. We don't see this, but we do see it when it comes to the hijabs and, and, and letting many Western women experience what it's like to wear one. Uh, what do you think is the agenda behind all that? Yes, there's an English word in America called so, uh, social engineering. If you want to understand Islam, you need to understand social engineering. So from the beginning, Islam teaches that if you disobey God, we should give you qisas, which means punishment. So many times these cultures are not uh, doing these things by choice, but rather because of fear of being reprimanded, and many times shame, many times the woman is told, you bring shame if you don't wear this. So when they come to America, they're doing the same thing, creating what we call social engineering. So September 11 happens, we continue saying Islam is peaceful. We get the Boston bombing, Islam is peaceful. You know, it's the same agenda. Another attack in San Bernardino, I mean, the guy shoots them during a Christmas party. You know, uh, uh, the media was not even willing to say Christmas. Uh, they were willing to say it was a winter celebration, but it was a Christmas party they were shot at. So the struggle we are in today is there is a plan to social engineering. So in America, we say, you know, Americans are very open-minded. They like to experience things. Uh, many, many young ladies, are, it's exotic for them. Uh, we always meet uh, women who got married to a Muslim man and converted to Islam and then later left Islam and got saved because they discovered that this exotic idea of putting a hijab on, maybe he told her some things about Islam that she thought it was nice. It's, it's in reality, it's not true. It's the facade, it's a veneer of religion. At the core is a political structure. I mean, I was in Minnesota in June at the mosque and we asked them imam a question about Saudi Arabia. And he, he said, Saudi Arabia does not represent Islam which I had about 80 people in the room, they all laughed. It's like saying the Vatican does not represent the Catholic Church. But right. regardless, right. one of the ladies there had the hijab on, she's considering Islam. And when the Imam said that they don't believe in the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus, she looked at her boyfriend and she said, oh, you never told me that. He goes, well, we'll get to it. And it showed up again, this idea of social engineering. Let's introduce a little bit here, Let's say, oh, why don't you put the hijab, uh, another group, they say, would you fast with us during Ramadan, just one meal and give to the poor? So at, at face value, I like that. I feel, oh, wow, they're building bridges at face value. When you dig deeper, you find out, no, there's a deeper agenda here. 
Because once you join Islam, you cannot leave. It's illegal to leave Islam. And so the struggle for us is that Islam becomes a political system. You enter, you cannot leave. And uh, uh, instead for us as believers, you can choose. You have the, the privilege and the opportunity to choose. God calls you. God seeks you. God puts things in your path. In the prodigal son, God is waiting for the prodigal to come back. Uh, while in Islam, Muhammad said uh, that anyone who does not believe in this, it says that the Quran says, "Arsalna Muhammad Naviran." So he is a, he is a, someone who sent who sent to tell you there is a punishment if you don't convert. So there is a struggle for us, and for for us as Christians, before we get to the Western mind, as Christians. We view that God created man and women as equal. The Quran in chapter 4, verse 34, says that men and women are not equal. In chapter 2 of the Quran says that men are higher than women. So one of the struggles we have in Islam is that women cannot discuss religious things because Islam teaches that they are not capable of discussing spiritual things and religious things. While for us, we have the words of Mary, the Virgin Mary, in the Bible. The words of Elizabeth in the Bible. Deborah, Ruth, Esther. Because for us, God speaks through all his people, men and women. And even Samuel, who was a child, God used that experience to speak to us. Here, where he said, Lord, speak because I am listening. So it's important to understand that there is a core value that's different. The Bible says God created humans, men and women. They are equal in the sight of God, and they are equal uh, in their abilities. Now, it's true that we have different roles and different, like a man cannot have a baby. God set it up that way. But it, men, it's important to understand that in the sight of God, we are on same footing. There's no one more important than the other. Amen. And before I move on to the next question I have for you, Far, I do want to recommend that our viewers go to your website. There, there's a PDF on there called Dating a Muslim, Understanding His Religion and Culture. This is a great PDF that you guys had there on crescentproject.org that informs women if they are either dating a Muslim or if they know another female who's dating a Muslim. Uh, this does, you know, in, in a loving way, let them know about uh, Islam and its view of women. And it's very important that Western women are aware that Islam is much different than Christianity. Uh, it's a religio-political system, and as you said, it's a little bit at a time. Uh, asking the, a woman to do this, asking a woman to do that, uh, whether it is a, a promise of pleasing the law or whether it's uh, pleasing the man or whatever it is, uh, we're just see a little bit by little, and it's not just only happens in relationships between Muslim men and, and Western women. But this is also the case when it just comes to uh, Islam in general. As we are seeing these dawah tables, we're seeing these wear hijab for a day tables for solidarity. And uh, just giving this watered-down, sugar-coated version of Islam to the West that does not line up with the primary sources. When we read the Quran, the Hadith, the Sira literature, and about Islamic expansion and all of that stuff. Now, again, on, on this episode, we're talking about... Uh, women under Islam, and many times people quote the Quran when it comes to women, uh, Quran 434, uh, re regarding wife beating. Why does the Quran allow uh, a man to beat his wife? Yes, it's a, women are seen are as a part, property for men. The Quran says that they are your field, so sow your field wherever you are. In, in many ways, you and I think, oh, this is a stress on the family. That's not the case. The case is that as a man, it's a tribal understanding. As a man, you need your family to grow. So the younger the bride, the more children. The more children, the more sons. Uh, our culture wants sons. And as you dig deeper in Islamic history, you find out that uh, the idea of a woman having procreation so we can have more jihadis. Uh, there is a book uh, in the medieval time that had a chapter, uh, The Necessity of War in an Islamic State. Uh, see, the Quran does not talk about manufacturing. It does not talk about agriculture. The only thing it mentions is trade and battle and war. So historically, as the Muslim army and Muslim empire grew, the only way they would fix their economy 
is by fighting. There was no concept of let's do manufacturing or agriculture. Now, sure, as uh, you know, they invaded other cultures. The Persians came in, brought their culture, the Greeks, the North Africans. Uh, when you find the Andalusian uh, Empire uh, uh, under uh, the Arabs, the, the, the Umayyads there, you find there was some manufacturing, some agriculture, but they borrowed that from the people. The Quran does not mention these things. The Quran talks about trade and warfare. So the concept is that the woman is there to be a mom, to have babies, and then Muhammad uh, allowed divorce and allowed polygamy because now... It's an Arab mentality. I need more tribes. I need my tribe to grow. It's not the concept that a man and a woman will become one and then it's a family. The Bible says I should love my wife like Jesus loved the church. So our concept is that my love for my wife, we create a family. It's our family. It's not about the tribe or the race or, or uh, you know, uh, Arab versus non-Arab. This is one of the struggles. And the reason... We wanted to write something on uh, dating a Muslim man. Is my wife and I were in Jordan, and we're standing there uh, in a like a museum, and we meet an American woman with her husband, and the husband says, "I'm gonna go get the car." And she was from Ohio State University, and uh, we asked her, "Is she enjoying uh, Jordan?" She said, "Not really." Uh, I said, "Why not? It's a beautiful country." She goes, "Well." I met this young man in Ohio State University, and we got married. But when we got to Jordan, I discovered that he has another wife and three kids. Mm. So I was shocked. I said to her, weren't you aware that Islam teaches polygamy? And she goes, no, I didn't study Islam. I asked him, and he said they believe in the Ten Commandments. And I said, what, will you, uh, what are you planning to do? She goes, I don't know. Should I divorce him? Should I ask him to divorce number one? Uh, I don't want to go back home. I'm afraid from what my parents and friends will say. And I was shocked. This was a college student. <laughs> I mean, that's the first thing you do. You ask the man, what does it mean that you believe in the Ten Commandments? So we, we right. noticed that the concept of family is not the same concept like American culture, although we have issues in American culture, but that's not even biblical. I mean, for, for us, polygamy is not a solution for divorce. Polygamy is sin in the scripture. Uh, it's one man, one woman. Yeah. At the same time, you cannot say, I want another person, neither a polygamy or polyandry. The wife cannot have more than one husband, and the husband can have more than one wife. So it's a different understanding. And thanks for bringing this up, because as believers, we need to be aware that this is an issue happening. Second, it's an issue in the Muslim world. Many times, uh, women end up having to deal with a second wife and a third wife. And the children grow up thinking, well, that's mom number one, and this is mom number two. What does that mean? It just it messes with your mind as a man how to view women. You view them as a something for my pleasure. Or, you know, today I, I have wife number one. Uh, five years later, I'll get number two. And here in the West, uh, we... You know, we see, okay, if, if one man loves one woman and tries his best to, to love her and care for her and please her and all of that, uh, doing that with one woman is already uh, takes up a lot of your time. So, uh, and, and we do want to be devoted to that one woman, as we read at, in the Bible, how Christ loved the church. And we are supposed to love our wife, wife one wife. And the wife is supposed to respect her husband. This is what we see in the Bible. We see that man and woman are equal as far as nature, and they're equal in their value before God. God sees them as equal uh, people, and that they both are in need of a Savior, that Jesus Christ died for both men and women, that when both men and women repent, put their trust in Christ, that is when they are reconciled to the God of the universe, and all of that. We don't see this uh, polygamy that we see in the life of Muhammad, who said, hey, you can have four, but then, of course, you know, he was the exception to the rule. He had more than four uh, himself. But we, something else, though, too, just so that our viewers are aware, uh, from one of uh, Bill Warner's books, uh, Bill Warner, he's uh, from Political Islam, he has taken the primary sources and really broken them down scientifically in uh, computer systems and stuff like that. And if you look up the status of women in the Quran, 
Uh, high status, we're talking 5.3%. Equal status to men, 23%. Low status, 71%. So we definitely see that women on, are on a much lower level than men. So this causes people to ask, Fwad, uh, does God think that women are inferior? Now, before you answer that, I want to let our viewers know uh, that is that is um, uh, taking into uh, account the idea that the Quran is God's word to begin with. But let's just say, if it were, uh, does God think that women are inferior to men or what? See, in Islam, you have to study the Quran and the Hadith to understand the religion. There are some voices now asking to get rid of the Hadith. If you get rid of the Hadith, Islam goes away because a lot of things we do in Islam, that's not in the Quran. For example, direction of prayer. Uh, how we pray. What do you do before you pray? How, what do you do in the mosque? How you sit in the mosque? Uh, are the women in front or next to me or behind me? So it's very important to understand that we have to take them hand in hand. So Allah of Islam, we can discuss that in another episode, is Allah of the Quran the same like the God of the Bible? But the God of the Quran, Allah of the Quran, repeatedly in the hadith says that there's a problem with women. So uh, in the hadith, God punishes men by creating women, which is borrowed from Greek mythology, because that's what the Greek mythology taught, that God punished uh, men by sending them women. Uh, the hadith says that Prophet Muhammad said to his followers, uh, majority of people in hell are women. He has a statement where he says uh, in Al-Bukhari, he says that women must do the alms because many of them are in hell and they better do work harder so they can be uh, escaping this uh, judgment. Uh, the other thing is, in Islam, you can divorce your wife because she cannot clean house well. Oh, well, that's maybe give her a class, maybe how to clean the house. You can divorce your wife because now she's too old, which is a problem. Men get old. How come they, their wives don't change them, you know? So we have a struggle. Is from the, from the structure, the religious structure, women are inferior, they sit in the back, men in the front. From the spiritual uh, structure, they are inferior, most of them are in hell. Uh, the statements like, you better obey your husband or else he will not let you enter heaven. And then socially, all these rules on them, because they carry the shame and the honor. So it becomes a, a pressure on women. Many women suffer because they have that pressure. Now sometimes you might meet, meet a Muslim woman who's an engineer or a doctor, and if you look, you find out these people studied in the West. They studied in America, Canada, Mexico, Latin America, maybe Europe. So you're not talking to somebody who's really purely following Islam. You're meeting somebody who got her degree in a, in a uh, Western uh, schooling, number one. Number two, you'll find that if they wear the hijab, it's more of a political statement or more of a shame culture that I want to honor my husband. Uh, it's always great to talk to them. I was in O'Hare Airport, Chicago Airport, and this lady waiting for a train, young lady stood next to me with the hijab. I said, great, she's Muslim. She's already told me she's Muslim. So I said, salam alaikum. She said, alaikum salam. I said, where are you from? She goes, I'm from Morocco. I said, how long have you been in America? She said, nine months. I said to her, I have a small booklet. It's called Adha in the Injil, Sacrifice in the Bible. Can I give it to you? It's about Abraham and Jesus. She smiled. She goes, I would like a copy. So I gave her a copy. And the reason I'm sharing this story is many times with the wearing of the hijab, that does not mean they are religious. It does not even necessarily mean that they know the Quran. All it means is they put the hijab as a statement, either that they are honoring their father or, you know, they somehow want to say, you know, we're Muslim and Muslims are nice. But the idea is, uh, take that initiative when you see someone with a hijab to talk to them, ask them where they're from, and give them something about scripture, about the Bible, about the gospel. Amen. 
And I want to encourage our viewers as well, Fouad, that Adha in the Angeal is another booklet, another resource that's available on your website. Now, friends, check out that website, crescentproject.org. So we do have to take a short break. Check out the website. Check out unlockthetruth.net as well. And uh, keep this in mind uh, during the commercial break as well. Again, statistics by verse count, women referenced in the Quran, positive 7.3% of all the verses in the Quran equal 25.2 and negative references to women that makes up 67.5% of the verses about women in the Quran. So please keep that in mind while we take a short break. We'll be back for more colliding worldviews in just a couple of minutes. Get ready for the International Apologetics Marathon as the first day of the marathon launches on October 2nd for seven days with attention-grabbing and educational apologetic shows that will equip you with everything that you need to know regarding topics such as Islam, political and ISIS, debates, as well as learning how to defend the faith of Christianity. Enjoy daily live shows that are two hours long each with your host, Tony Gurley. Professors with PhDs, pastors and ministry leaders politicians, and world-renowned speakers who specialize in the several topics on Islam and Christian apologetics will be participating in this marathon. For more information, please call the numbers at your screen or visit our website at trinitychannel.com. Digital Tree is now accessible through our Facebook page. Go to Trinity Channel's Facebook and click on the first post that says, Click here to start experiencing the Digital Tree today. That link will take you to our website, and from there it's as simple as clicking on what you want to watch. For more information, call the number on your screen or visit our website at trinitychannel.com. Hello, friends. Welcome back to ABN's Trinity Channel for another episode of Colliding Worldviews. My guest is Fouad Masri, president of Crescent Project. And I want to encourage you to check out crescentproject.org to find his book, Connecting with Muslims, A Guide to Communicating Effectively. Also, before the break, we're talking about Adha and the Anjil, which you can find there as well. He also has... Uh, um, uh, Bridges, which is a great uh, six six part DVD series. If you want to do some training for people in your church or small group or whatever, for what I tell people all the time, I say, hey, uh, Crescent Project's Bridges study is the least intimidating training out there on on what you should say to your Muslim neighbors and coworkers. Uh, friends, etc. So I, I've actually taken a number of, of people through it, different churches through it, and I want to really encourage people to get that because, again, if, if you say, hey, I have Muslim neighbors, coworkers, uh, what, what do I say to them? It's like, you know, if I am I going to see them every single day, well, then, you know, I have more to lose if I offend them or if I say the wrong thing or maybe get in trouble at work or something like that. So uh, what can I say to them? And for what I love, the way that you encourage people when when they when they see a Muslim to to see them as someone who Jesus Christ died for, someone who needs the gospel, and just be be friendly, say hello, which a lot of people don't even do. You know, they're kind of surprised sometimes that hey, why is this American, you know, saying hi to me, and then saying uh, you know, saying hello, asking them where they're from, asking them, hey, have you read the New Testament? And they might say yes or no, probably no. And if they say no, ask them, well, why not? They might say, well, because it's been changed, which of course allows us to do some apologetics, let them know the Bible's not been changed. Or they say, well, hey, I just don't have one. Well, if they don't have one, well, hey, would you read it if I gave it to you? And that allows us Christians to give out a lot of Bibles to Muslims. And all the Muslims that are here in the West, friends, this is an opportunity for you. If refugees or whoever else are coming here, 
then they're coming to a country where you can freely give them a Bible, which you cannot do in some of the countries that these people are coming from. So in that sense, see this refugee crisis as an evangelistic opportunity. But Fouad, uh, once again, it's great to have you back here on ABN's Trinity Channel. Thank you. Great to be with you. And thanks for encouraging as a church to uh, rise up and cross the bridge and share with our beloved neighbors, co-workers. Islam is the problem, but Muslims are the victims. And many times they need our uh, words of comfort and our love in the name of Jesus. Amen. I was just watching a, a DVD last night, Fouad, and it was about missionaries who were going to many different countries, many Islamic countries. And he was talking about when he was in, I forget which country he was in, it was in uh, Southeast Asia. And he, he heard the, the uh, call to prayer coming from a nearby mosque. And he was just saying how, you know, th this is like a, a, a roll call to prisoners of Islam and saying, hey, we need to get the gospel out to people who think Islam is true, who think Muhammad is, a, is an actual prophet of God, who believe that the Quran's actual eternal word of God sent down. And as we've been talking about, this supposed eternal word of, word of God uh, puts women on a much lower level than men. We see that a woman's testimony is equal to half of a man, enmity, half of that of a man. Women are the main inhabitants of hell, according to the Quran. Now, Quad, what is the basis for women's rights if a woman is living under Sharia, or even if she's living in the West, but is trying to uh, honor a husband who wants to live under Sharia, at least in their home, if not when they walk outside their home? Yeah, Muhammad is the model Muslim. So it does not matter what a person says. It does not matter, you know, if somebody stands up and says Islam is peaceful or Islam is jihad. That doesn't matter. What matters is Muhammad, according to Islam, is the one who interprets the religion. That's why the hadith, the life of Muhammad is impor important because as a Muslim, the Quran is not does not have all the details. In the life of Muhammad, he's the model Muslim. So when it comes to male-female relationship, men and women, you follow what Muhammad did. So I started the program by saying he had 13 wives. Some say only 12 of them were married, real marriage. The 13th was a, um, what do you call that, pleasure marriage or temporary marriage. Also, marriage? Muhammad in the hadith says he had five favorite concubines. Concubines are slaves for sexual activity. Now, we don't know how many he had, but it says that he had five favorites. So our struggle today, when we talk about male-female relationship, as a Muslim, you go back to uh, Muhammad to find out what is Muhammad's uh, uh, treatment of women. So he married, his first wife was Khadija. She was a widow. So Islam allows you to marry a widow. Um, uh, Muhammad abolished uh, adoption, so you cannot adopt. You can raise the kid, but you cannot adopt him. You have to have all your own kids. Uh, Khadija gave Muhammad children, but Khadija, when she married him, supposedly he was pagan and she was a Christian. According to the Quran, it says that she was a uh, uh, Nazarene or somebody from the Nasara, from the Christian, and that her uncle was a preacher. Basically, Muhammad did not remarry until Khadija died. So in Islam, you're allowed to marry someone outside your religion, whether they're Jewish or Christian, it's okay to marry them, and they don't have to necessarily convert. Well, basically, that's how it starts, but then things happen. Uh, then uh, uh, Sauda bin Zama'a was his second wife. His third wife was Aisha. Now, because Aisha was married at age six, and uh, the Quran and the Hadith says that she was one of his favorites. Uh, and uh, I just finished a book on the Hadith, Women uh, of Muhammad. It highlights how uh, Muhammad always wanted to uh, have his uh, uh, time with Aisha and he would go to her tent. But Aisha was married at age six. Uh, the Hadith said the marriage was consummated at age nine. There's some discussion. It's the other way, nine and uh, consummated at 12, but regardless, Muhammad was in his 50s, was about 53, 54 years old man, and he married a six-year-old young girl. So the issue today in Islam is you allowed that uh, gap in marriage. Um, 
a uh, cousin of mine lived in Saudi Arabia. Her neighbor died at age 95. At his funeral, he had three wives. The oldest was 27 and the youngest was 16. So it's in our culture, according to Islamic culture, it doesn't matter the difference. If you feel like you want to marry a younger person, you can, because Muhammad was 50 plus when he married a six year old. Uh, there is a struggle with that. Many times they try to give excuses and they say, you know, God told him to do this. At the end of the day, that's a measuring stick. If Muhammad did it, then why not? Uh, um Salama was the wife of one of the uh, disciples and uh, he died. And uh, basically he died, but he had converted to Christianity in Ethio uh, Ethiopia. I'm sorry, not this one, Um Habiba. But Um Salama was one of them. Zainab bin Khuzayma. Uh, and then Juairia. Uh, Juairia was the wife of uh, a person that uh, uh, a Jewish tribe that he attacked, and uh, uh, they gave him this woman as a, uh, a trade, so he won't kill the, the Jewish uh, tribe, which is a problem uh, that here we see Muhammad prioritizing a woman and to have a wife in exchange of truce with a, a Jewish tribe. Uh, Zainab bin Jahsh is another problem. Zainab is wife number eight. And uh, that uh, that marriage is uh, a problem because it deals with the Quran, chapter 33, verse 37. Uh, that deals with the adoption. Uh, Zainab was the wife of uh, Zaid, who was his adopted son. Uh, the only... Uh, uh, children that survived was Fatima. All Muhammad's children died in as young age, including Ibrahim, his uh, one of his favorite sons, died very young, and I, I think nine years old. So uh, Zaid was adopted, and Muhammad sees Zainab bin Jahsh, and he likes her, and so she te he tells his uh, adopted son to divorce her, and he married her. Once that happened, the Arab tribes those who had converted to Islam was pretty uh, disappointed because that's what we call in in, in, uh, in English social incest. You know, usually you call your uh, your uh, your uh, uh, daughter-in-law or your son-in-law. It's like a family. So in Quran 33 verse 37, that's the verse that God gave Muhammad to stop adoption and give permission for him to marry Zainab bin Jahsh. Uh, Maria is the Coptic uh, uh, slave woman that uh, Muhammad liked her and ended up having her be married. Um Habiba is the uh, the wife of the disciple who became a Christian in Ethiopia when they ran away to hide among the Christians from the pagans and Muhammad mar married her. Uh, Safiya, uh, Safiya was a, a, a Jewish uh, daughter of a chief and... Uh, Muhammad uh, had jihad on the tribe, killed the father, the husband, and the brother, and married her that night. Uh, so she was, uh, as they say, in, uh, as you say in Arabic, she was one of the spoils. She was one of the spoils, and uh, he chose her. And then Maimuna is number 12, and Rihanna number 13. Rihanna is the one we're not sure if it was a pleasure marriage or was she a legal wife. But regardless, Muhammad's lifestyle becomes the model, how he treated his wives. So many times they say he treated all wives equal. And uh, Muslims today, they say, if there is polygamy, you must treat all the wives the same. You buy them the same house, same furniture, uh, but there is more than just stuff. Can you Definitely. have love to four women at the same time equal? Is that possible? Um, you can say, I love all my children equal. Yeah, these are your children. But the relation between man and woman is set by God as a unique relationship. Now, Fouad, you've mentioned all these different wives that Muhammad had, but what about this temporary marriage that some people have heard about that does take place in Islam? Why, what, what's up with that? Yeah, uh, Muhammad allowed his men to have a uh, pleasure marriage. Its Arabic word is mut'a. Mut'a means pleasure. Uh, sometimes the Farsi um, language will use the word sighe. Sighe means permission. So uh, the Sunni branch says that this was only during battle 
and um, but allows something else called misyar. Misyar means if you're traveling for a long time, you can ask a woman to be your wife for you know a few weeks, few months. Uh, uh, you can even come back and visit her. So misyar is legal, but sighe, which is now practiced mostly by the Shiites or pleasure marriage, which means a Muslim man can ask a Muslim woman to have sexual relations with him maybe for two hours or three hours or three days or three weeks. Uh, this practice is very common in the Shia community. And all you have to do is give her a gift. It could be a Quran. It could be a necklace. It could be a watch. You just give her, a, as they say, a dowry. And you say the Shahada and Al-Fatiha, which is the first chapter. And then you can have sexual relations. Even uh, as recent as when Ahmadinejad was the president of Iran, he allowed, he gave permission for Iranian men to open their homes for their daughters to practice sire, which means as a Muslim man, you can say to your daughter, if you have a man interested, he can come to the house, pay the dowry, and have sexual relation with you, whatever you set, one hour, two hours, which... I mean, for me, that's legalized prostitution. That's allowing people to use uh, prostitution for monetary gain. I mean, using sexual activity for monetary gain is prostitution. What is that? I mean, the Quran says that prostitution is a sin. So just because that of sire, it becomes a permission to kind of go around the, the idea of prostitution. And so the position of a woman is no longer an equal thing for men. It's more like a toy, a pleasure, a, 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 a tool, you know. I, I want to get married so I can have kids. Uh, I, want, I have sexual needs, so I want to get pleasure marriage. It's no longer this idea, I care for you as a person, that we're together in this. We are a couple together, married together. And as we find, when we look to these sources, the Quran, the Hadith, the Syria literature, well, we see that the religion of Islam is, of course, spotlighting men in particular and is very appealing to carnal men out there in general, especially when we see the things that and read about the things that Muhammad not only did himself, the things that he allowed Muslim men to do as well. But uh, how is polygamy uh, justified in Islam, especially, you know, why people wonder, well, you know, number one, why is polygamy even allowed? And two, why did Muhammad say that you can have up to four wives, but then, as you already read, Muhammad had more than four himself? He's just the, the um, uh, you know, he's not lining up with exactly the, the rules that he gave other men. Yes, thank you. Um, I remember talking to a, a Muslim man, and he said, no, no, Muhammad had four at the same time. So I went and did some research when I, when I started my ministry, well, that's not true. Uh, basically, he probably had eight at the same time because some of them had died. Um, in there. But uh, Muhammad broke the rule, and they say he, it was a permission because he was a prophet. Um, one of the struggles, what happens to us because of Muhammad's lifestyle, it, it moves the conversation from what is the role of a man and a woman in marriage to the man's view of women. So women become a, a target, a goal. That's why many times women want to wear the hijab. They want that security because socially they are weak. And uh, if there is rape, it's their fault. They carry the shame. So many times they are not judged. They are not judged according to their story. They say, no, it's your fault that the man raped you, which you and I as men, we know that that's not the case. If, if I am in a situation that's problematic, I leave. I leave the room. I leave the, the car. I leave the hotel, whatever. And so it is very uh, embarrassing. We just had a rape case here in the state of Indiana. And the struggle is, is this man blaming the woman because he's a Muslim man, that she was, it's her fault? So again, that the... the uh, there were last Christmas in Germany, in Cologne, Germany, 700 women were molested, raped, or uh, or uh, had physical attack. A majority of the people had uh, Muslim immigrants, men. And um, 
the the mayor of the city made a statement that it's time for women to dress modest in Germany. Well, that's un unacceptable. If someone is dressed immodest, do you rape them? Is that how we want to live? So uh, sadly, because that's the situation in many Muslim countries, especially Muslim countries where there is no exposure to the West. So the more you go into areas, you know, uh, in uh, outside the the edges of the Middle East. So if you're in, in the heart of Turkey, in the heart of Afghanistan, heart of Iran, many times these women feel like, uh, I, I would rather have the burqa just as a way to kind of make sure that nobody knows who's under the um, the, the shador. Sadly, though, uh, that doesn't stop. We have uh, a lot of s stories. There was another uh, story of um, a family that came to Christ because a family member wanted to marry the daughter that was age nine and the one that was age 11. And that was a huge problem and that led them to faith in Christ. So uh, the concept of uh, a women in Islam becomes they carry the shame and the honor and also they become the ones who uh, uh, suffer legally. Uh, today, in a court of law, an Islamic court of law, the testimony of one man is equal to two women. So if there is any situation, rape, anything, all a man have to do is find one friend to tell the same story, agree on the same story. Then the woman has to find four. So this is one of and the we... struggles. If I say it was her fault, and a buddy of mine agrees with me and we tell the judge, now the judge has to have this lady find four other women. And so that's going to be impossible if this was done, in a, you know, in a secluded area. Uh, so and, the, legally, a Muslim woman has that issue. A Muslim woman does not inherit the same like a man. Uh, although Muhammad allowed Khadija to own her business, uh, so some Muslims will say, uh, Muslim women are allowed to own their business, but then what do you do with polygamy, with child brides? What do you do with, um, you know, uh, the idea of uh, giving your daughter away in marriage to a, someone with a year, you know, years, a gap of years? You know, this is not, you know, I understand somebody being older five years, ten years, but we're talking about, you know, people getting married age 16, 17 to 53 year old men. Well, that's, that's a big gap. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, a few different things that you said there, just about Ahadijah saying, oh yeah, Muhammad allowed her to own her. I mean, it, I think this is one of the things that people need to understand is that Hadijah was Muhammad's pre-Islamic wife. She owned the business before she married him. So she was, she was the uh, ideal independent woman. And nowadays, you know, a lot of people look to her saying, oh yeah, um, you know, she, she was an independent woman and, you know, the wearing the hijab and nobles women. And they always seem to have Hadija in mind, but they skip over all of these other wives who you named where they didn't own their own business. They weren't independent women. Uh, they were definitely on this lower level that we see Islam put women on. There's actually a show that we did on the last International Apologetics Marathon. It was called... Hadijah, Muhammad's pre-Islamic wife. If our viewers haven't seen that, I want to encourage them to go to Trinity Channel's YouTube channel or go to my Vimeo channel, vimeo.com forward slash Tony Grillet, and you will see that. The two ladies who I had on that show were Beth Grove from Fander Center in the UK and then also Rocky Nasser, a former Muslim. Uh, but also, too, just the whole thing about rape. I mean, Fouad, under Sharia, if, if a woman says that she's been raped, she has to produce four male witnesses uh, here in the West, that pretty much means that unless the four gang rapers turn themselves in, well, you know, this is never going to be uh, any evidence on the women's parts. So, I mean, how much less than that uh, in the other countries where this is happening as well? Now, Fouad, what I want to ask you, so we only have a, a, about five minutes left in the show, is of course there are Muslim women out there who just do this uh, willingly only because they want to please their husband. They aren't, like you said, very religious. Uh, they already already have idea that Islam is false. They're hearing uh, snippets of the gospel that is being shared, that's being spread. Uh, Trinity Channel shows go to you know four different continents where people are hearing the gospel. How can churches and Christians reach out to Muslim women 
in their community? And also, what happens when a Muslim woman says, I want to be baptized, and she's still wearing that hijab, but she believes the gospel? She says, hey, I've repented of my sin and put my trust in Jesus Christ. I want to be baptized. Uh, what should churches and Christians do in these situations? Thank you. Number one, we need to see the person behind the clothes, behind the word, the veil. Okay? Uh, Jesus in the Good Samaritan story tells us that we don't look at people, uh, what, uh, what is their religious background or cultural background. They all need Jesus. So one of the things that we need to do is show love, show respect. Even if we disagree with Islam. I disagree with the hijab completely, but I show respect. And I don't want to talk to Muslim women about the hijab. I want to talk about Jesus. So that's number one. Number two, when you start talking to them, you find that many times they have questions. Uh, and uh, the decision on putting the hijab or taking it, let the Lord speak to them. So a Saudi woman who heard the gospel on campus in Arizona became a believer. On the third Bible study, she walks in and she says to the lady discipling her, I need to take the hijab off. She told her why. She goes, I was doing my Bible study, and Jesus says, anyone who commits sin is a slave for sin. But if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. If I wear the hijab, I'm showing that I'm still a slave. I want to set myself free. Perfect. A lady, Muslim lady, got married uh, to a Muslim man, Shia Muslim man in Toronto. She wears the shador to honor his family. Uh, somebody started talking to her as her kids were playing soccer. She becomes a believer. She becomes a believer. She is now attending Bible study. She's sharing the gospel with other Muslim women. She told me, I'm keeping the hijab on because it gives me opportunities with my in-laws and my mother-in-law. So which one is the right way? I think hijab is not from God. Hijab is oppressive. But instead of me telling people what to do, let the Holy Spirit tell them what to do. See, the difference yeah. here for us is we want people to follow Jesus, not follow what I think or someone else thinks. Let them follow Jesus and guide, God will guide them. The lady in Canada was felt that this is a way to have the door in. The lady in uh, Arizona, the Saudi lady, felt, no, that's not the way in. This is me putting this on means I still agree with these teachings. Either way, God is going to use it. And if I may share with our audience today, God is moving in special ways. Muslims are responding in special ways. It is a joy to see people who come out of Islam and share their testimony. At the Without Borders conference, there's going to be a panel of women from Muslim background who got saved. And they're not wearing the hijab as a statement that Jesus is their freedom. Jesus is the hope. Not culture, not a piece of clothing, and not some kind of teaching that was, you know, taught to them by an imam or religious leader who's usually a male telling them what to do. It's exciting to see that God is moving, and I would love to see people come and uh, encourage these women who are taking a stand for the gospel. Amen. Fouad, I want to thank you once again for being on Colliding Worldviews, for sharing all this great information with our viewers. I hope that our viewers go check out your website, crescentproject.org. Check out this upcoming event. Uh, there's other events coming up, too, so check out the calendar. Also, again, get Connecting with Muslims, Fouad's book, and we'll show you again there on the screen as well. You can get this on Amazon or anywhere else where you buy books. And again, this is in book form some of the least intimidating training out there on reaching out to Muslims. There's some apologetics in here, but there's also just a lot of uh, ideas and tips on building relationships with the Muslims around you. If we Christ as Christians do not share the gospel with Muslims, well, who's going to? No one's going to. We can't expect a non-Christian to share the gospel with a Muslim. And therefore, that's why I want to thank you for being here on Colliding Worldviews today. Thank you, Tony. Great to be with you. Thank you. We'll talk with you soon. Friends, please check out, like I said, crescentproject.org. Check out all the materials that they have there. Again, there's PDFs you can download for free. You can order books like this one, like Adha and the Injil that we talked about in this show as well. And again, as I, I, I'd seen in that video that, we wa that I watched last night, um, you know, this, this call to prayer for Muslims, you know, if, if you are not a Muslim, you know, we see this. It, it was, they put it in, in a great wording saying, hey, this is a roll call for prisoners, prisoners of Islam, people who think that Islam is actually true, which it is not, and they are they are slaves to it. 
and we need to repent and put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are a Christian out there and you want to reach out to your Muslim neighbors, again, check out Fouad's resources. And we need to love our Muslim neighbors. But remember, too, though, just loving them and doing kind things for them is not the gospel. The gospel takes words, and that is that can be words that are spoken from, from your own mouth, or you're like if you're giving someone a CD or a DVD to listen to or to watch, or they can be words in a verbal in a verbal form. You can give someone a gospel track. You can give someone a gospel of John. You can give someone a Bible. But the gospel takes words. Words are required to share that good news about Jesus Christ, who he is, his sinless life, his death on the cross, and his resurrection three days later. And that through repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be reconciled to the one true God of the universe. So we pray that if you have never repented and put your trust in Christ, that you would do that today when you realize that Jesus is Lord. Pray out and ask to God, uh, you know, let me know if Jesus is your son. And if he is the only way to you, then I want to follow him. So friends, we pray that you will repent and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And to our Christian viewers, thank you so much for being here and reach out and love your Muslim neighbors and share the gospel with them as well. It's the most loving thing that we can do. Friends, we will see you next Monday for another episode of Colliding Worldviews. Mm -hmm.